Hello there, I'm Sam. I'm Steve. Uh, and we're going to be giving you a bit of an insight into our latest single, If You Sell The Piano. So this song came from your lived experience, didn't it, Steve? Yeah, it came from a bit of reality and a bit of imagination, this tune. Um, we wrote the song in the summer of 2020, when everyone was in lockdown, if you can remember. But it just come to a point where the rules had developed where we could now spend time in bubbles and we found a family friend's unused holiday home to go and write some songs in and um, everyone had a lot of time during lockdown to i think reflect on who we were and what we wanted to be it actually benefited the songwriting process quite a lot to have that that time to think during that time i got quite attached to facebook marketplace and spent a lot of time scrolling on there for the latest hot deals it wasn't but just I, you it wasn't just you <laughs> But I, I really wanted an upright piano, um, so I was searching. I actually stumbled upon a very um, similar make and model to a piano that had some sentimental value to me. That emotion and that sort of heart skip was was where the idea and the concept for If You Sell The Piano came from. We basically wanted to write a song about this last physical artifact of a relationship being the sort of symbol of like finally letting go. If they can sell the piano, then that means they're completely done with you. But you on the other hand as the protagonist in this song is finds themselves in a, a dichotomy of separation and being okay with that, but also desperation for things to not be completely clean cut. I don't know what it is. Are we, are we too egotistical to just say, no, it's fine, don't love me anymore? Like, wh what is this song? Is this song saying, still love me a little bit, but um, just don't sell that piano? Because <laughs> it means something to me. I don't know. Last thing I'd like to say on the the songwriting was I feel like for a lot of the new songs that we, we've wrote so far um, over the last few years, they kind of felt like they became this development of organic material, you know, songs about our own lives, but we also drip fed a bit of Hollywood, a bit of sort of movie magic into them. It's one of these songs that I feel like it had all the organic material there to start with and it was very easy to to make it a bit more um, appealing for everyone that I feel like everyone in the band is hearing and picturing the same song mm. in particular yeah. with this, this concept. Yeah, nice. Thanks for the reminder that lockdown happened as well. I... <laughs> yeah, remember that? <laughs> forgot about, about that one. one. The, the song is actually quite a sad song mm. and quite a, you know, not not a position you want to be in, you know, crying over your ex-girlfriend or whatever. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, the track itself, if you didn't listen to it with any lyrics or any vocals, it actually sounds quite upbeat. I remember programming some drums, just like some demo drums as, as a starter and Sam and Tom bringing acoustic guitars in immediately and they were these major sounding sort of um, double guitar track and I thought, what the hell was this? I was originally referencing Caroline by Fleetwood Mac for this tune, which is this dark, yeah, groovy yeah. sounding track, loads yeah, of percussion. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, it, there's kind of the beauty of working with, with everyone together, but it came out with this juxtaposition of happiness in the music. But I think it's probably like the first time we've really done that, isn't it? That like we've had sad songs and we've had happy songs, but I don't think we've really before this necessarily had a truly happy sounding song it's actually really quite yeah. quite miserable lyrically you're all getting conned it, you shouldn't yeah. be you shouldn't be happy <laughs> listening enjoy to this one. it you're <laughs> meant to be crying but yeah i suppose that it's like the point about the guitars there i mean that's something we wanted to kind of keep i think when we approached the recording of this is that well let's let's listen to the drums and the acoustic guitars yeah sure yeah. Yeah, the drums are a mega, and then we've got these, <laughs> these twinkling little acoustics. That, that was basically what we had for them. Because you guys, I don't know if it was an artistic choice or whatever, but when you originally recorded it, you recorded it on the nylon rather than the steel string, and it kind of gave it that like janky, dusty sound. And then when we tried to do, well, when we tried a steel string when we're tracking it, and it's like, no, it's too nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more, it leans into that... Um, juxtaposition and that contrast more I yeah think got the... well i think that's because i think that's something we were very aware of when bringing this one together the, we recorded a real real piano for this as well um if you've been following on social media you've probably seen it in many photos and stuff recently but um 
it's the piano that's in Tom's front room. And um, then we tied it in with uh, Nord piano on Sam's keyboard itself. So you get a bit more definition from that. Yeah, there was a there was a point in the arrangement of the song where actually the electric guitar was taking precedence over the piano from a rhythmic standpoint in the choruses. Mm. In, in the demos, the guitar was really jangly and the the piano was actually the instrument that was playing just held chords, you know, one to four, holding back through that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think that was that was a conscious choice, isn't it? When I feel like there was a rehearsal once and we were like, should shouldn't the piano be the main thing in the song that is about a piano? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it it took until the outro, and that is just such a classic air trope that it, the song only becomes groovy at the outro and I think we've learned from that in our last sort yeah. of couple of releases but yeah we've been we definitely got less scared about being all in earlier on we just bank on having a very patient and understanding audience you're gonna get your nice bit it's just gonna come in the last <laughs> 10 right seconds the and it'll fade out yeah. <laughs> it actually took you a couple of attempts to get the right drum sound first didn't it yeah it took me a couple of goes um because you you you'd originally programmed the drums for it well, I think I literally couldn't play what you'd program because I need three arms. But then interpreting that into a kit part, yeah, it, it, it's quite a hard one because we wanted, I wanted to get quite a raw drum sound, like something that sounds quite quite genuine, like obviously a drum kit kind of thing, with this extra eighties reverby, gatey, again getting the kind of polished with the kind of crusty, and our lovely friend Hugo that mixed this did a great job love the toms and that's all that's all played at once and then there's also these killer killer toms in the, the uh, verses which I overdubbed over the rest of the kit lovely he nailed it and then on top of that we all love a drum machine here at Air, so there's a load of uh, program stuff that sits underneath. The references being stuff like Caroline and a load of other 80s and 70s tracks. It was, yeah, we just wanted to make sure that the, the, the fact it's a real drum kit came through, you know, that we really, really that really came across. Yeah, I think um, that that summer that we were wrote, writing these songs, the th- third, third third Haim album came out. Yeah, and that of really took a sort of um, raw and gritty steer. And Haim have always been a band that have inspired us massively as a collective. Mm. Um, and I do feel, that although we wrote the songs in tandem with the album being released, when it came to actually producing these songs, it it only felt right to sort of you know work in a bit of that side of it i know you in particular really love oh, i've always music. yeah they're they're the their whole drum sound and the atmosphere that they kind of create with the with the percussion and stuff has always been a big big influence for me i think i i think the guitars are pretty high me on mm-hmm. this one as well there's that really nice where's the, your little moment <laughs> Tears for Fears. Even though some of the tracks can be produced in a variety of ways, I do feel like our our vocals, or at least the BVs, have a prominent character throughout all of them. Yeah, definitely. Hugo did some cool stuff with this one. I don't need you to be there to hold. No, all I wanna know is, are you really gonna let me go? Cheers, Hugo. You made it sound a lot better than we did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so they they don't need auto tune, but it's it's just like those little quirks that someone with near like Hugo has. They there's kind of things that you might not notice, but they really add character and depth to a mix. It's where, the character for sure, and yeah. it's like the the yeah, and like the the slight movement that that auto tune brings and stuff, just in the context of the vocal, those sudden dips and falls, they really help accentuate everything. Perry's ability. To, 
to design backing vocal arrangements that isn't just singing along with the lead vocal. You know, he picks the moments where you get the most rhythmic oomph from them. And, you know, if it, if I had my way, I'd just be singing root, third, fifth throughout the entire line. But Perry's got the, the patience and attention span to be like, oh, we should come off here, come back in there. And people like the staves and time are, are really good at, at decorating yeah. the lead vocal like that. So he's got a good ear. Well done, Perry. That's Giving out all the, all the <laughs> kudos. <laughs> Along with the backing vocals and the piano, there's some little... Um, little bits of synthesizers that are really helping uh keep the momentum going so in that in that second chorus we bring in this arpeggiator here Love it, but yeah. They, they, those, those little rises and swells as well. Like they, we, we really, they're all over this EP. They're all over these tracks. Just really lean into those moments. It's a, you know, the little things you can do to just help lift a section or just keep them, keep the movement going. Like once you've got the the main elements that are gonna reappear in every chorus, it can be fun, but also quite dangerous to overarrange. But yeah, I think we're getting better at knowing what's gonna serve the track underneath everything else rather than just yeah. throwing on as as many layers as possible it's never going to sound unmusical but yeah everything needs a purpose and if you can if you can pull the fader down to zero and you don't miss it then does it need to be there you know bin it in the bin we hope you enjoyed our breakdown of if you sell the piano if you have any questions or you want to see more of these videos let us know in the comments and we'll see you next time